Hey folks, Dr. Mike Isertel here for Renaissance Periodization, RP Plus, RPU, lecture number five in fat loss nutrition, fat loss periodization. Ooh, very, very fancy sounding. So what are we going to talk about today? First, we're going to address the question of why we can't just keep losing weight, losing weight, losing weight, losing weight, losing fat, losing fat, losing fat. Why do we need some kind of structure, maintenance and breaks and all this other stuff? Why can't we just go? And we have to answer that question in order to even justify this discussion. After we answer that question, we're going to talk about why a need for maintenance phases even arises. We're going to talk about the birth of a phasic structure, like this phase, that phase, this phase, that phase, basically as an analogy, we're going to talk about why you can't work continuously with no weekends ever. We're going to describe the weekend maintenance phase, and then we're going to describe what a week looks like. Work week, weekend, work week, weekend, work week, weekend. That's that phasic structure that alternates. And then we're going to do a sample uh, of what that actually looks like to give you guys a real good real world view of what this should look like. Because it's one thing to talk about theoretically. It's another thing to see like, oh, okay, that's how much weight we should, try to be, we should be trying to lose. This is what's realistic. This is what's not realistic and put it into context. So question, why not just keep losing fat forever or until you meet your goal? And so let's say you start out at 200 pounds and you want to weigh 160 lean. Why not just go, 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 go until you can, right? And people will say like, oh, you don't need periodization for fat loss. Um, just eat less and move more. The question is uh, not that does that work, but for how long does that work, right? And so here's the thing. Long-term continual caloric restriction results in a couple of things. It results in muscle loss. It results in increasing levels of fatigue, specifically diet fatigue. It results in performance loss. And it results in an increasing chance of rebound, which is really real. Not only rebound, but actually just falling off the plan without even accomplishing your goals. So if basically, as you diet longer and longer and longer, you get this buildup of all of these negative factors that not only increase your chances for failure, but they increase your chances of the whole process not working out into your favor, losing a bunch of muscle, so on and so forth. And they also increase your chances for even if you succeed for just radically just coming right back up and gaining a bunch of fat back and so on and so forth. This is a really, really bad deal. And here's the thing. You don't lose fat so you can get lean once probably, right? You probably want to lose fat so you can keep as much of it off as you can. Right? And even if you're a bodybuilder and you actually just lose fat periodically and gain it back, you ideally don't want to gain back like, uh, you know, 15%. You might want to gain back 5% or something like that. So even for people who just dip into low body fats every now and again, the degree of rebound and the success of the process, and remember muscle loss for bodybuilders is totally off limits, has some validity. You can't go forever because you're not just trying to get to a goal. You're trying to get to a goal, survive regain stability and prosper. Uh, to use a really harsh, almost not analogy, example, you know, the region, original, original story of the Greek uh, victory at Marathon, the Battle of Marathon. Supposedly, you know, some messenger ran uh, 26.2 miles, declared to the leadership that the battle had been won and promptly died of exhaustion right there on the steps Gee, you know, that's not the greatest thing for dieting. So if you really just want to go and lose all the way down to your goal and sort of die at the end, you won't die, but you'll rebound like crazy and end up back in the same spot. That's not exactly ideal. So if someone was saying to pick a pace to run for the marathon, you sure as hell wouldn't pick that guy's pace if you were in his shape. You want to pick something a little bit more conservative, take a break, so on and so forth, right? So if your plan is to be lean for a day and then just rock it back up, um, then you know, you're good to go. You can just diet forever until you get to your goal. But if your plan is anything other than that, then you probably want to do something at least occasionally to reduce diet fatigue, let it fall back down so you can have another productive run at a diet, right? And a one-shot approach seems reasonable if you're talking about reasonable amounts of weight. For example, when if you weigh 200 pounds and your goal is to just weigh 180 permanently and be leaner, is it a good idea for you to drop all the way down to 180 in one diet? Yeah, maybe, maybe not, right? Uh, depending on specifics, your coach could say, well, yeah, I think we should drop to 185 first and then take some break and then drop to 175 and then let you rebound to 180, fine. Because, you know, 
there's going to be a little rebound from any diet. And that means, you know, go 200 to 175. That's pretty tough diet. So maybe that's a little bit of a stretch, but it's a little bit of a stretch and you can kind of say, I really, really hold my shit together. Then maybe I'll be okay. And maybe I won't have to worry uh, so much if I just am really careful on the rebound. I can do it. Fine. But if we're talking about 15% or more that you have to lose, we're talking about one-shot diets that just have a really low chance of success. You know, if you weigh 200 pounds and you have to get to 160, that's tough. If you weigh 200 pounds and you have to get to 130, right, as your long-term goal, one-shotting that, I've never seen anyone do. And, well, successfully, I've seen people get there in a rebound all the way back up. Real, real big problem, right? So, because we can't diet forever and we need these breaks at some point to drop diet fatigue, we develop this need, theoretically, for what we could call a maintenance phase. And what are maintenance phases? Well, they're months, multiple months long phases of weight stability after fat loss phases. Why are they needed? Well... Because all hypocaloric periods and fat loss diets are fatiguing and they're exponentially fatiguing. And that is the longer the fat loss diet goes, the more exponentially the fatigue rises from it. Diet fatigue and the chances for rebound hunger, all that other stuff. At some point, you got to shut it down and let all that fatigue come back down, right? It's like trying to work super hard on something for four weeks straight with zero weekends and barely any sleep. You're just going to collapse at some point or your productivity is just going to go straight to hell. Even if you somehow manage to uh, pitter-patter along, muscle loss will result eventually. It will will result in good health. It will result in a terrible look. All really bad things. And psychologically, dieting is really difficult. Even if there was no physical reason you have to take a maintenance phase, the act of restricting yourself is not a sustainable act. At some point, you have to just go and relax and eat some normal food, re-tune yourself to just living normally, and then you're ready for another hard, you know, couple months of dieting to accomplish your goals, right? And even if you make it through all of these and you successfully end the diet that's way too long, if you survive the fat loss phase, your chance of rebound is massive uh, if you one-shot a lot of weight loss. So maintenance phases take care of all of this stuff by reducing Uh, your diet fatigue back to normal. And they do this over a very long term. So basically you just set your calories to maintenance, right? So let's say you down to 150 pounds from 170. You eat as many calories uh, per week as keeps you between 150 and 155. So the first week you might bloat up a little bit, carbs and salt, you weigh 156. And you're like, okay, we'll see what next week is. Next week it's 153. So you're good. Next week, it's actually 149 because your bloat went away and you're like, ooh, 149, my metabolism is speeding up again, so I need to up the calories and you start upping the calories a little bit. And then it's 150, 149, you up the calories a little bit. 150, 149, you up the calories a bit and all of a sudden you're eating like a lot of calories eight weeks later, you don't feel super hungry, you're not super cravy, psychologically you feel like you're ready for another diet and then maybe it's time to start another diet versus keep going and just burn yourself to the ground, Right. How often do we need these uh, maintenance phases? Uh, Roughly every 5 to 10% weight loss. So that's a good figure because it obviates the duration and the rate. It doesn't matter. It's just the total that results. So, you know, if you weigh 200 pounds, uh, 5 to 10% weight loss is some weight between all roughly 190 and 180 pounds. So you can make it to 185, you can make it to 180, but I wouldn't go lower than 180 if you start at 200 without taking a maintenance phase for at least some time. How much time? Well, after you get to whatever goal, anywhere between 5%, maintenance phase can last anywhere from about two-thirds to one and a half times the length of the actual preceding fat loss phase. That's a big deal. People talk about refeed weeks, which accomplish largely a whole lot of nothing. Refeed days almost certainly accomplish nothing in terms of long-term fat loss. Those are some conditions bodybuilders may use for some exotic things. They do not apply to almost anyone else. Diet fatigue takes a long time to rise. Weeks, months, it takes just as long to fall. Sometimes even longer. 
How do you know if it's between two thirds and one and a half? Well, if you only diet for a very short time and you're not very aggressive with your loss, the loss rate, you might be able to do two thirds. So if you diet for six weeks and you only lose half percent per week, a maintenance phase might only need to last four weeks after that. Totally reasonable. If you diet for three and a half months and you lose 1% per week that entire time, holy crap, that's like 14% weight lost, then one and a half times the length of that is something that is a real good thing to think about. So that's like, what's that, five months of maintenance or something. Sounds crazy, but remember, um, we're here at RP, we're concerned with getting results as fast as possible, sustainable results as fast as possible. Unless we really believed it and we thought we had the research to back it up, we would never say you should rest for or maintain for one and a half times the length of the diet if we didn't think it was necessary. I myself have been burned with this before. If you have to ask, and we're going to mention this later, err on the side of longer maintenance because you basically just want to clean the slate for sure before your next fat loss diet. The purpose of the maintenance phase isn't to just tell yourself, I did a maintenance phase, now can we just get back to dieting? The purpose of the maintenance phase is to bring down all forms of diet fatigue so that you're basically back almost to square one, where you feel like you've always weighed this weight. You, the week after a diet, are going to feel like, I just did a diet. Someone's going to be like, brownies? And you're going to be like, yes, <laughs> right? But if eight weeks later, someone's like, brownies? And you're like, oh, then you're sort of just yourself again, Right? That's the goal of maintenance phase, and we're going to take as long as we need. So while some people can do two-thirds and some people need one and a half, what you need is going to be when you can honestly tell yourself that your hunger is back to normal, your diet fatigue is back to normal, your energy levels are back to normal, everything feels fine, you're psychologically really, truly, in your heart of hearts, ready for another fat loss diet. You can lie to yourself, and that's fine. Nobody cares. You're just going to have a bad time by yourself. Right, So the purpose of the maintenance phase is to do that bringing down, which means you have to be honest, and it's going to take a long time. Two-thirds to 1.5, the average there is something like the length of the diet and the length of the maintenance phase after are roughly the same. I wish it was something different. It makes a lot of sense though, right? Like You generated this much diet fatigue. It took you three months. It's probably going to take you about three months to take it off. So being that we need maintenance phases... And, of course, we need fat loss phases still to actually do the job. Uh, we can start to see the birth of a phasic structure here, right? So the long-term approach to losing lots of fat uh, might need some combination of fat loss phases and maintenance phases, right? Uh, do we always need the maintenance phases to be, like, about the same length as fat loss phases? No, right? Do most people at least benefit from starting with longer maintenance phases and seeing how they feel? And, it, you know, let's say you do a three-month maintenance phase after a three-month diet. And after two months, you can honestly tell yourself you're totally cool. Finish the three months. And then next time, be like, okay, maybe two months. And try the two months. And if at two months, next time you do maintenance phase, you're like, oh, no, I can still use a little bit of a break. Take the break. But if at two months you feel golden just like you did last time, then two months is cool. So erring on the side of more is better because here's the deal. If you err on the side of more, you just, quote, unquote, lose to your normal life anyway. It's not losing a month of potential fat loss dieting. So you're just living normal life. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> if you shortcut it and you err on the side of too less or too little, you end up uh, having a high chance of rebound and pissing away almost the entire fat loss phase. That's a two part problem. Part one is that you pissed away a fat loss phase. Part two is that you suffered through a fat loss phase, right? Like if someone said to you, uh, Hey, sit in this comfy chair and uh, here's some coffee and here's some magazines to read. Wait for 30 minutes. And if a girl with a red balloon walks by, you win 500 bucks. And if she doesn't, after 20 minutes, you can just go home. Yeah, you read your magazines or you play on your phone or you even do work. You have your coffee. It's super comfortable. And the girl never walks by. You never get 500 bucks. What did you lose? You lost 20 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever. You know, whatever. It's like, that's like being a maintenance phase. Like, you know, you're living life. Like, it's fine. I'm the coffee was delicious. The magazine's great. Everything's great. That's not the analogy to the fat loss phase going south on you. That's the maintenance phase. That's what it's like to spend an extra month in maintenance. Like, yeah, okay, I didn't win the $500, right? And there's nothing to benefit from this maintenance phase. It was too long. But now I go home and, or go to my job and make $500 the honest way instead of spotting girls with red balloons or whatever the hell crazy shit I come up with. The analogy for instead shortcutting your maintenance and be like, oh, I'm ready, even though you know you're not. 
in starting a fat loss too soon, fat loss phase too soon, burning out or rebounding, right? Being back basically the same way you were, uh, is this. Somebody tells you, hey, um, it's like 40 degrees outside. It's fucking raining. Go stand out there without an umbrella for 20 minutes. And if the red girl comes by, you get 500 bucks. I'm like, uh, okay. I only have like a t-shirt and shorts. They're like, you're golden. 500 bucks. And you're like, sweet. So you go out there. Fucking girl never shows up. No red, no red <laughs> balloon. No money. What did you lose? It wasn't just the time. It wasn't like reading magazines and having coffee. It wasn't maintenance phase. It was fat loss phase, a fucking brutality of standing in a fucking cold and rain. Like, this, this fucking little girl better show up. I'm saying, I'm taking that red balloon off of her one way or another. Damn it, I'm getting my $500. And when she never shows up and there's nobody around, you're like, okay, best been 20 minutes. I hate this. Why? It's not just that you wasted the time. It was, it was a very difficult time. So if you're thinking, ooh, I can do this fat loss phase and I, can, I think I can do it. I don't know. Can you? If Because if you're not sure and if you burn out of it, you just didn't waste that time. You wasted the time and the brutality of the effort of the fat loss phase. Because if you're going to piss away a month or two, you might as well be in maintenance when you're having pizza and fun with your friends, right? It might as well not be in a, a pissed away fat loss phase. I hope that makes sense, right? So most people benefit from erring on the side of more rather than less. The result will be something like taking a fat loss phase, then going to maintenance phase, then a fat loss phase, then a maintenance phase, and so on and so forth until you reach your sort of ultimate goal and can do a maintenance phase to get the last bit of the last diet's fatigue off and then go to a phase we call balance in the RP books. Just living a healthy lifestyle, training, eating, loving life, and not worrying too much about your body weight. Totally cool, right? Is it tempting to just skip this whole phasic structure and just one shot the thing? Of course it's tempting. We're not going to sit here and tell you like, oh, you got to do the phasic approach and just you know, slow and easy and careful. Of course, we're all tempted to be like, let's just get this done now. But that's not how it works. If that worked, of course, everyone would be doing it. Everyone would be succeeding with it. The thing is, most people are doing it, but almost none of them are succeeding with it because it doesn't work. Where does that leave us? Let's go to an example really quick. So we have someone who wants to hold around 160 pounds and they're starting out at 200 pounds. Now, let me make this perfectly clear. That is a very, very big change. Do you ever mistake people who weigh 160 for people who weigh 200? You'd have to be blind for that, right? Here's another question. Do you ever not notice when someone used to weigh 200, but now weighs 160. Oh my God, it's out of the question. So while it's only 40 pounds, I don't even know how, as a lot of people in society think 40 pounds is not that much. And you know, a lot of the increase we get at RP, people are like, I want to lose 50 pounds. And we're like, what about 40? And they're like, that's not enough. That's not, that's nothing. Like 40 is not nothing. It's huge. What a huge change this is. 200 pound individual who's not very well trained is visibly fat. A 160-pound individual who, that same person who's relatively well-trained, has some maybe 10 pounds extra muscle, is in great shape. That's CrossFit shape right there. So this journey from 200 pounds to 160 pounds or so is going to take us roughly, what am I looking at here? About a year and a half, almost two years. Some of you watching this might think, what are you talking about? 40 pounds is like something you lose in a summer. Oh, and you're completely correct. If you plan on rebounding and just going totally sideways and regaining all of it back. My wife and I watch a show called My 600 Pound Life. If you ever motivated to lose weight or need motivation, watch multiple episodes of that show. You will have no problem losing weight. It's individuals who are candidates for bariatric surgery and they have to get under 600 pounds to be approved for the surgery because otherwise it's just too difficult and too uh, taxing on them and too uh, risky for their health to even do a bariatric surgery where they remove most of your stomach and staple you back up and then you're never, full, you know, you're full after an apple and you lose a bunch of weight. The percent success rate with individuals that are that large is like less than 5%. It's tiny. And these are folks who can lose 40 pounds in like a month, right? That's, that's how big they are. That's how small of a percent of their weight that is. So when people say like, oh, it's just 40 pounds, people do it all the time. Those are precisely the people that almost never succeed, 
right? Be like, oh, that one 500 pound guy lost 40 pounds. Like, mm hmm. And what's he up to now? Like, oh, um, I think he weighs 550 now, but he lost it before. But like, no shit. Right? So rebounding, not a clever trick, right? Uh, the problem of how to lose weight has been largely solved by society. Like, uh, you know, if aliens are coming and they need 10 people to lose 100 pounds each, and these people are 300 pounds, we got all the tools. We can make them lose weight. If the aliens say, now they need to keep it off for 10 years, Earth's in deep shit, <laughs> right? If they got the phaser gun pointed at Earth and they're like, these motherfuckers are fatter after 10 years, boom, boom, North Pole, right? Uh, we're really in trouble. So a lot of this is going to look, when I'm going to talk about this example, we're going to talk about these really small chunks of weight loss at a time and these long maintenance phases. You're going to be like, why are we going so slow? Because keeping the weight off means these gradual shifts and settling points that never freak your body out to be like, oh my God, I'm starving. Oh my God. And shovel back food in. It's all about taking that measured approach, not too slow, but definitely not too fast. Definitely not one shot because this person at the end of this journey, 160 pounds or so, it's going to feel like they've always weighed 160. They're going to have the health habits, the lifestyle habits, the food habits, the training habits to support it. And they're going to weigh 160 for as long as they want to versus someone crash dieting from, you know, June all the way through October, losing 40 pounds, taking a bunch of selfies, pictures, Las Vegas, all you can eat buffets, lose motivation, fall off track, come back at 205, rejoin your CrossFit gym next June and be like, oh, I got to lose this weight again. People do that all the time. This is crazy, and I'm sorry for ranting. All the fucking time people do this. They're going to have this. They do redo the same fucking challenge over and over again. Every year, every New Year's. The same 20 pounds comes off, except they're up five pounds, up five pounds, up five pounds. On the same 20, they lose. Because they're not doing this in large part. Let's take a look at this example. First, we start in June. So remember that. We start in June, June to August, three-month diet. We go from 200 pounds to 180 pounds. Pause. At 180, after losing 20 pounds in your first diet, you can just smell 160. You can taste it. You can feel it, right? It's like going halfway up Mount Everest or 70% of the way there, and you can see the summit. You're like, ooh, let's just go. And you're like, nope, there's just dead people up there. You got to get to base camp. And you got to rest. So 180. And then during, then this is kind of like, I don't want to say a worst case scenario, but this scenario puts in a lot of padding. From September all the way through December, nice long maintenance phase through the holidays and everything. Great time for maintenance, by the way. You go from 180 pounds to 185 pounds. Yeah, you gain a little bit of holiday weight, a little five pounds, no big deal, right? Some of that might have been water, some was fat, no big deal. You're still down 15 pounds. Next, we go from January to March. You know, nothing happens January and March anyway. Perfect time for dieting, by the way. Mostly because it's winter and it sucks. Unless you're on the south side of the world, then January through March is sweet. So just die during the uh, uh, the summer. January through March, we start at 185 and we get to 170. Now again, 170. <sighs> Let's just push it. Let's just keep pushing it. Let's get to 160. Don't do it. Don't do it because it's a real bad deal and you're going to have a huge chance of rebounding. Stop at 170. Now, this is when the psychologically tough stuff happens. March, we stopped at 170. April to July, we go from 170 to 175. It's been a fun summer, right? And we're not saying you need to gain five pounds, but a lot of times you will, just from just living normally, having fun, and doing a maintenance phase. It's okay. Plus or minus five pounds, no big deal. August to October, you restart the diet, okay? And you go... From 175 pounds to 165, notice that's just 10 pound drop because now you're getting leaner. Your body's starting to hold on to fat more. It's taken more oomph to get the same amount of fat off. So we got to just set smaller chunk goals. And because you're lighter, the percent of weight loss is similar to what it was when you were heavier and more weight. 165. Again, this is, becomes really tempting. In October... You finish, basically November 1st rolls around, you weigh 165, you're like, good, I could just finish this. Another five pounds, I can crash diet all the way into Thanksgiving, late November, and I'm done. But are you really? Because you get to 160 at the end of Thanksgiving, what happens by the time the holidays are over? You didn't just get to Thanksgiving. You got to 160 pounds when you shouldn't have, you should have stopped at 165. If you would have started your maintenance phase right on November 1st at 165, you would have had way lower diet fatigue 
and not much to begin with because it's only 10 pounds, and way lower because it's three weeks or four weeks, three weeks until Thanksgiving, by the time you're eating your Thanksgiving meal and getting ready for all the fun Christmas food, you're like, yeah, you know, you're a normal person more or less. Like, yeah, food's fun, but it's not that fun. You're not like going to be eating 10 turkeys in a row. But if you do that 160 instead of 165, and if you end that Thanksgiving instead of a couple weeks before, you are going to turn the holidays into a giant festival of stuffing your face. And what's going to happen? You're going to be all the way back up to 170, 175. You're going to have zonked yourself back to last April? Why? That would be so ridiculous. So stop at 165. Here's the deal. You're going to have fun during the holidays. November, December, great, great time. 165 to 170 pounds. You're back at 170. That sucks, sort of. But you're back at 170 and you have almost no diet fatigue to speak of because you took your damn time. Now, in January and March is our last stretch. We go from January, January, February, March, three months. We go from 170, it's not that high, to 160 finally. And then April and beyond, we hold 160 to 165. We enjoy eating and training. Boom. And that last time that you get to 160 right? Or really the first time you get to 160, you got there by losing just 10 pounds. And you got there after you had all of November and December as a maintenance phase through the holidays. The diet ends almost anticlimactically. It's like running past the finish line in a marathon and looking behind you and you're like, am I, am I the first one over? And they're like, yeah, new world record. And you're like, okay, no one's pushing you. And there was no yelling. You're not even tired. Wouldn't it be great if all marathons were like that? Wouldn't it be great if the only thing you had to say at the end of a diet was like, huh, I, I, that wasn't that hard. So they're like, okay, now you just live your life and eat healthy and have a couple cheats every now and again and just, just weigh what you weigh. And you're like, okay, I can do this. This is the easiest thing in the world. Versus you scratch and claw your way to 160 after ignoring all the advice and just plummeting down. Let's say you just only took two, like one maintenance phase instead of like four, or whatever we recommend. And you know, someone's like, congratulations, you weigh 160, that's so great. Like, you're just going to weigh 160 from now on? And you're like, uh-huh. And they're like, is that going to be tough to keep the weight off? And you're like, <laughs> yes, fuck, I just want to eat my own hand. Can I eat my own hand? Can I function without a right hand? I mean, robots are cool. I'll probably have a robotic hand soon, right? That kind of thing, people think they're only goal-oriented. They're only oriented to the end of this. Boom, I got to get here. This is bullshit. This is where you want to be. So if you get here, oof, and you've got breathing room and you, all you, have, you have all your maintenance strategies in place, this is easy. That's how you want to arrive to the end. That's why periodization for fat loss is super important. Folks, see you next time for the next lecture, which is going to be on adjusting calories and macros to make sure your plan is on point. See you then.